your name. The mountain shake and crumble at your name. The oceans roar and tumble at your name. Angels will bow. The earth will rejoice, your people cry out. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. Sings your story and your name, angels will bow, the earth will rejoice, your people cry out, Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise.
sing a song of your salvation and all your people sing along so remember your people remember your children remember your promise oh Your grace. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Have I reached down to us? Your grace is enough for me. bring us back to him he is the one he is jesus Cause here is our king here is our love here is our god has come to bring us back to him he is the one he is jesus Sing it again. here is our king here is our king here is our love here is our God has come to bring us back to Him. He is the one, He is Jesus. Sing majesty. Majesty.
I want you to take your Bibles, please, and open up to Romans chapter number 1. You should be uh, familiar with where Romans is by now. Uh, There ought to be a well-worn place in your Bible. Uh, We've been studying all summer long, Romans 1 through 8, and today we're beginning a brand new emphasis for the next eight or nine weeks. For a couple of months, we're going to be thinking about change or transformation. Uh, And uh, and I want to begin with you uh, that journey today beginning in Romans chapter number 12. Can I begin while you're finding your place in Romans 12 by telling you one of the things that just absolutely drives me crazy? And I think there are especially some men in the room who will will sort of feel my pain with this and and, uh, and a lot of ladies as well. One of the things that just really is kind of a pet peeve for me is when something does not live up to uh, its advertising. When something says it will perform in such a way that it will do something and then you go buy it, and it doesn't work. Does that just drive you crazy? Um, I can't stand to bring a product home all excited about what it's going to do in my life or in our family, put the thing together, you know, plug it in, flip the switch, and nothing. I mean, just, it just absolutely drives me crazy. And there's a word that I learned or learned when I was in Kazakhstan. I learned them in Russian a few years ago uh, that, that sort of have become my catchphrase for when things just don't work. Uh, Let me explain to you. In 2003, uh, I went to Kazakhstan because Tracy and I were adopting our our daughter, Christina. And so we spent 30 days in Kazakhstan, in the far northern reaches of Kazakhstan, in a place really about 100 miles south of Siberia. And the the place where we were, where Christina lived and and the orphanage there, was not a modern city at all. In fact, Everything that we encountered in that town or in those towns seemed to be about 50 years behind where we were in the United States. So, for instance, we were in a hospital at one point, and that hospital looked just like a MASH unit that you would have seen you know, on the MASH TV show a number of years ago. It was just very antiquated, very outdated, and everything in terms of technology and, and buildings and automobiles 
everything seemed to always be in a state of disrepair. It seemed like a lot of things just didn't work. They were kind of worn out. And so while we were there, I kept hearing this phrase. Those Kazakh people or Russian people would stomp their foot and they would say, never built it. And I finally said, what does never built it mean? And my translator said, it means it doesn't work. Never built it. And so this became my word for 30 days. Every time I touched something that didn't work, I would say, I would look at a Russian guy and go, ha, never built it. And this kind of became my word when I got home. So, so every time, you know, we're doing something at home and something's just not working right, this is what I say. I said this one day here. We were doing something, a group of us working, and something wasn't working. I went, and they went, what'd you say? <laughs> they thought I cussed. I, I wasn't cussing. I was just, you know, being bilingual, okay? And so, it doesn't work. Well, I want to ask you a question this morning. It's kind of a provocative question, but I want you to let it settle into your heart and kind of answer it honestly. Here's the question. Is Christianity working for you? Robotit. Does it work? This summer, 535 people prayed to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior through the influence of this church. Can we be confident that Christianity will work for all 535 of them? Some of you in this room this morning. Prayed to receive Christ over the last 12 weeks of our Code Blue uh, season. Is Christianity working for you? Are you finding that it's working? Or here's another question. Some of us have been saved for many years. I've been saved for 28, 29 years now. I should ask myself the question. If you've been saved for a few decades, is Christianity working for you? Some of you go to Christian schools. Is Christianity working for you? Some of you grew up in Christian homes, and so all of the influences of your life have have been Christian-based. Is Christianity working for you? Now, if your answer to that question is, well, sure, I prayed to receive Christ, I have faith to believe the gospel, I believe He's my Savior, and I'm going to heaven, so it's working for me. Well, if that's your answer, then amen. I would agree with that, but that's not really what I'm asking. What I'm really asking this morning is this question. Is Christianity working in your life? Is Christianity changing the way that you live? Is your faith affecting the fabric of your life? Maybe here's a way to ask it. Are you a better husband because you are a Christian? Is Christianity transforming the way that you relate to your spouse? Is Christianity transforming the way that you relate to your parents? Is Christianity working for you as an employee? Or is Christianity working for you as a citizen of your community? Now when you ask the question that way, the answers don't roll off our lips quite as quickly, do they? Because it's one thing to say, yeah, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, it's working. But then when we honestly begin to examine our lives and say, is it working for me in the fabric of the way that I live, then that answer is a little bit more difficult. And here's something that I think we all ought to consider as well. I believe that we would find the most honest answers to that question of whether or not Christianity is working for us in the fabric of our living if we were to allow other people to answer it for us. That's a little bit scary, isn't it? I mean, what if somebody could really be a fly on the wall of your life, 24-7, 365, and they could watch your typical way of living? Would they say that Christianity works for you? If they could watch the way that you deal with your wife? the way you talk to your wife, the way you talk to your husband. Young people, if they could watch the way that you respond to your parents. For all of us, if they could watch the way that we respond to authority. If they could see us in the high pressure moments when, when uh, the pressure is on and, and, and we're in secret places maybe, would they say that Christianity works for us? If somebody could watch our lives and see the way that we work on the job, Would they say that Christianity works for us? Or would they look at our lives and say, Christianity doesn't work for that guy or for that gal. This is what I want us to begin answering this morning. This is a huge question. I want us to spend the next eight or nine weeks talking about what it looks like for Christianity to work. To move from a belief to behavior. For our Christianity to transform from a religious faith to really begin to live a revolutionized 
sort of life. And the change that we're going to talk about over these weeks together is a change that will bless your life. It's a change that will bless your family. It'll bless your spouse. It'll bless your kids. It's a change that will bless your place of business. But more than anything else, it is a change that will glorify God. And this is where we need to be. I want you to write down a fundamental truth. This is going to kind of be our foundation for where we're going to go over these next few weeks. Again, it's a little bit of a, of a, a tough statement to swallow. But I want you to write it down, and then we're going to kind of build on it. And here it is. It is that for Christianity to work, I must be transformed. It's true. For Christianity to work, I must be transformed. As the ink settles into the page and that truth settles into your heart, I want you to look with me at the very end of chapter number 11 of the book of Romans. We're going to read the final verse of the chapter and then just two verses in chapter number 12. Romans chapter 11 and verse number 36. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Because God is glorious, I want you to now do something so that God's glory will be displayed through your life. Let's begin by understanding that what Paul is saying to his readers in Romans chapter 12, and by the way, the people to whom he is writing are born-again people. They are Christians who have already come to saving faith in Christ. So it's not a matter of whether or not Christianity will save my soul. But now he's going to talk to them about how Christianity will work in their lives. And talking to these born-again believers, he says to them, I want you to have something happen within you that will display the glory of God. Write it down this way. Here's what Paul is teaching them. He is saying to them and saying to us that change, change is the ultimate aim of the gospel. Change is the ultimate aim of of the gospel. Now, for us to really believe that, it will require a major shift in the ways that most of us think, because most of us don't think that way. Most of us think that the primary aim of the gospel is to get us to heaven. Seriously. I mean, if I were to ask you, hey, you know, the gospel by definition, by the way, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So if I were to say to you, hey, why did Jesus die and rise again? Most of us would say, well, to forgive our sins and take us to heaven. That's why. He died to open the door of heaven for us. And while that's true, that is not the main reason that he died. In fact, let me just say it to you so it can kind of settle into your heart. Jesus Christ did not hang on a cross and be crucified simply so you could go to heaven. That is not the primary aim. That is the end game. That's the blessed result of it all. But the primary aim of the gospel is so that he might change who you are. And as a result of changing who we are, then we are blessed to be able to go to heaven because he has changed us. Now again, this is a major shift in the way that we think, and so we need to unpack this together. Let me walk you through what he's saying in this passage. Go back with me to chapter number 11. And don't just go to verse 36, but back up a little farther in the passage to verse number 33. Now you have to understand this passage, by the way, in light of the context of what Paul has been saying from the very beginning of, uh, of, of the book of Romans. Uh, you'll remember from our study back in the summer that Romans chapter 1 verse 16 forms the foundation of the whole book. Where he says in that verse, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believe, to the Jew first and also the Greek. So in Romans 1.16 he says, The gospel is my theme. And then he spends 11 chapters explaining and expounding what the gospel is, who Jesus is, what Jesus did, and how the work of Jesus on the cross brings forgiveness and redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, all those things that we've talked about. So so that's the first eight chapters. 
Then chapters 9, 10, and 11, he deals with how the gospel relates to Israel specifically. So by the time you come to the end of chapter number 11, Paul is absolutely, gloriously exasperated at the wondrous work of God's miraculous grace. And this is the reason in chapter 11 and verse number 33, you can almost hear this man when you come to verse number 33. Having spent all of these 11 chapters talking about God's grace and God's mercy and how God saves people through grace, he says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Really what he's referring to directly is the fact that God saved the Gentiles as he set the Jews aside. And now through jealousy of the Gentile salvation, God will bring the Jews back into salvation. And that ultimately God's plan of grace will include everyone, Jew or Gentile, who will come to him. And explaining that, Paul goes, who would have ever thought of this except God? Who could have ever figured out a way to do this except the wise counsel of a holy God? And so he says... Whoa, God, you are amazing. You're glorious. Verse number 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways are past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who could have have understood that this is how he would do it? And who could be his counselor? Verse 35 basically means, and who could give anything to God, having not have received that from God In the first place, verse 36, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. And then Paul amens himself. And you know when the preacher amens himself, he's excited, all right? Paul amends himself at the end of verse number 11, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I mean, do you feel this excited sort of, Paul's just saying like, Dude, this is incredible. God, you're glorious. Does this ever happen to you, by the way? Are you ever reading the Bible or maybe God's just kind of you know, pouring out his spirit in your life and ministering to you? Do you ever in your own Christian life just go, Lord, I don't even know what to say other than you are absolutely incredible. You're awesome. This is exactly what Paul is saying. Now, you need to, to know, and let me just kind of stop and make sure you understand something before we go farther. You need to know that Paul is affirming in this in this celebration of God's glory. He is affirming what the Bible teaches all the way through. It's woven throughout the theme of Scripture is this idea that God is glorious and that everything that God does, He does for His own glory. This is specifically what He's saying in verse number 36. For by Him and of Him and through Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. I mean, make sure that you understand that your view of God and your view of life must be Christ-centric or theocentric, not egocentric. So it cannot be self-centered. It must be God-centered or Christ-centered. See, many people believe that everything that God does, He does for them. They have a very egocentric view of how God thinks and operates. So everything God does, He does to bless me. Everything God does, He does to rescue me. Everything that God does, He does to help me. Everything that God does, He does to heal me. Everything that God does, He does to save me. Everything that God does, He does to take me to heaven. I want you to get a biblical life, okay? That is not what the Bible says about God at all. Those blessings to us are the merciful overflow of who He is, but everything that He does, He does to glorify and magnify the glory of His name everything. On every day, in every hour, in every circumstance, God has a singular purpose, and it is to magnify His glory in this world. And that is what Paul is saying at the end of chapter number 11. God, you are glorious, and by bringing us into your mercy, we now get to be your partners in advancing your glory. If you're still tracking with me, say amen. Now watch what Paul says. Remember, the main aim, the primary aim of the gospel is change. So Paul celebrates the glory of God. He says, all glory is due to him. 
And then it's as if at the end of chapter 11, he's talking to God. God, you're glorious. You're awesome. All glory and power to you. Amen. You're glorious. And then he does this. Now let me talk to you, Romans. And he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, because you have been brought into the mercy of God, I'm urging you to let something happen in your life so that the glory which is true about our God will begin to be displayed through your life. And what is it that he wants us to do? He says, if you begin to read down through verse, or chapter number 12, verses 1 and 2, he begins to tell us what that is. I urge you to do something. What is it he wants us to do? Look at verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you... Present your body as a living sacrifice. Is that it? I just want to present my body, and that's what God wants me to do, to offer my life to him. That's not really it. That's, that's maybe the first step of it, but that's not really it. Keep reading. By the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Is that it? That God wants me to live separate from the world and not be pressed into the mold of the world? That's not really it. That's part of it, but it's not really it. Keep reading. Be not conformed to this world, verse number two. But, here it is, be ye transformed. That's it. God wants you to be changed so that your life, as it is being transformed, will put on display. Keep reading verse two. You will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you know what the word prove means? It means, to, it means to discern and display. Literally, the word prove means to test the validity of and to prove to let it be seen to, by others through you. Uh, let me illustrate it this way. Do you know what a, do you know what a uh, test pilot is? A test pilot is a man or a woman who is willing to climb into the cockpit of a jet for the very first time when nobody else has ever flown the machine that has just been built. There have been aeronautic engineers who have spent hours and made many calculations and have brought all of their intelligence and training to bear on a computer pad and a drawing board to create a design and they think that it will fly. It seems like it will fly. On paper it looks good, but it's never been in the air before. And then there are some people who have built a physical jet to the specifications of the engineered design, and then it's sitting on the tarmac, but it's never been in the air before. Do you know what a test pilot does? A test pilot straps a helmet on his head, gets in that cockpit, gets it up to whatever, 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet, takes it up to Mach 3, and then brings it back down safely and displays that what the engineer said was so is actually so. You listen to me. God designed a life for you that would display His glory to this world. And the only way it gets displayed is as your life is transformed according to the design that he made. God is never glorified through your life just because you asked Jesus to be your Savior. Can I say that again? The glory of God is not advanced through your life just because you prayed a prayer. Because nobody can see your faith. Nobody heard your prayer, perhaps. But God's glory is displayed when you are transformed. If you're tracking with me, say amen. So here's the primary aim of the gospel. It's change. God wants to change our lives. Now, I love the fact that he says, I want you to be, verse number two, I want you to be transformed. I want you to do something that will, that will glorify God, so I want you to be transformed. I want you to, the word means change. In fact, we're using the word change uh, in, in our graphic and kind of as the series title, but I've been so consumed in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, I've been reading transformed so much that I've been calling it transformed. In fact, in the five this morning, Chris and Tammy called it transformed because that's what I've been calling it. We were in a staff meeting this past week, and, and Jonathan, our worship leader, looked over. He said, so did we change the name of the series from change to transformed? I said, no, it's always been transformed. He said, no, it's not. It's been change. I said, Jonathan, it's always been transformed. It's, it's transformed. He said, well, the graphic I saw said change. I said, no, it didn't. It said transform. So we pulled it up on his computer, and I went, I like the name change. I think we ought to keep it as that. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So it actually doesn't matter because it means the exact same thing. Here's the word. Here's the Greek word. Metamorpho. That, that's the Greek word. Meta, and you know what word we get from that, don't you? Metamorphosis. Um, when, a, when a caterpillar goes through a metamorphosis, when a caterpillar wraps himself in silk and, and wraps herself up in a cocoon and disappears from sight, and a few days later begins to burst out of that cocoon, what comes out is a butterfly. But nobody with any intelligence at all would look at a butterfly and say, that is a caterpillar that has been tweaked, would you? Metamorphosis is not a tweak. It is a radical, complete transformation. And the word metamorpho literally means to change the essential nature of a thing. Let me tell you something. If you're listening, say amen. I, I, I want you to hear this. Jesus is not interested in tweaking your life. You got to hear me say that. He's not interested in that. Jesus doesn't do tweaks. He is into metamorphosis, okay? He's into radical radical, essentially changing who you are so that your life will display the glory of God. He says, I want you to be changed. There's one place, and we've got just enough time to do this, I think. I want you to hold your finger in Romans and go back to the book of Mark with me for just one quick second. Go to Mark chapter number 9. Let me show you two verses. There's a, there's a scene in Mark chapter number 9 which describes something that happened to Jesus. We call it the transfiguration. And I want to show you something about this text. Mark chapter 9 and verse number 2, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and leads them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And then verse number 2 says, And he was transfigured before them. Now, the word transfigured in English is the exact same Greek word from Romans 12 verse 2 that's translated trans... Um, uh, what's the word? <laughs> Verse number two, transformed. So transfigured is the same word as transformed. And it's metamorpho. And when he, when he says that in verse number two of Mark 9, he then in verse three describes what that transformation looked like. He says that his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow. So, so when he looked at Jesus, his clothes, his face, his hair, everything began to shine and was so incredibly white that it was like the noonday sun, they, they, had to blind, they had to cover their eyes. But look at what he says in verse 3. So as no fuller on earth can white them. Let me translate that for you. It's an old archaic uh, phrase. Here's what he said. So that no bleachery on earth could ever bleach anything as white as Jesus became. What he's saying was the change that happened in Jesus was heavenly. And here's what I want you to know. The change that Jesus wants to, to work in your life and in mine is so radically different than anything that we can produce that people will look at it and go, glory to God. Man, their God must be awesome because he is changing that life radically. That's not anything that they did. And so this is, this is God's desire. This is the primary aim of the gospel is to change us. And as we are changed, then he receives glory. Now, the second thing I want you to write down, and it's the last thing, in fact, that I want you to write down. Well, let me, let me, let me have you do this before we, before we move on. If you go back to Romans chapter 12, verse number 2, then you could rewrite that verse. And it would, it would sound something like this. We're going to put it on the screen for you. A little Dykes translation, if you'll allow me. This is what Paul's saying in Romans 12, two, uh, 1 and 2. Brothers, sisters, I urge you to be so completely changed that your life will display the glory of God's good ways. That's it. So that your life will display the glory of God's good ways. So that if somebody watched your life 24-7, 365, you're not gonna, they're not going to see a perfect life, but they're going to see a life so radically changed that they would look at you and they would say, Ristion steo revolted. It works. It's the real deal. Now the final thing I want you to write down is this. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1, Paul says, Brethren, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here's the point. That surrender to change is where our worship begins. I just want you to write that down. Surrender to change is where our worship begins.
If the primary aim of the gospel is to change who we are, then we have to recognize that that change comes from heaven, not from within us, as the Holy Spirit works in us, but it's the work of heaven within us. And in order for that to happen, we have to make an offering of our lives to worship. There's, there's a very Jewish flavor to what he says in verse number 1. Because if you're reading chapters 9, 10, and 11, he just spent three chapters talking about the Jewish form of worship and how they make sacrifices to God, and that's the way they worship and relate to God. So when he comes to chapter 12, he says to them, I don't want you to stop making sacrifices. You don't have to bring a lamb anymore because Jesus is the Lamb of God. But here's the sacrifice I want you to make. I want you to offer your own life to him. Okay, So when he says your body, do you know what he means? Not just give yourself as a martyr, that's not it. He's saying your life, everything that you are. Everything that encompasses your life. Everything that defines and describes who you are. Your passions, your possessions, your, your uh, uh, ambitions, uh, your character, your relationships, your marriage, your kids. Everything that you are is to be laid before him as an offering, fully surrendered. And he says, this is where worship begins. When he says your reasonable service, he's simply he's using an illustration, talking, hearkening back to the days of the temple when the Jews would worship there and their worship would be very thoughtful, very well thought out and logical and they would come and offer to God. And he says, the way that you offer worship God now is you bring your life and very thoughtfully you consider this and you surrender to it. Now here's what that means. And this is kind of heavy. This is pretty tough, okay? But it means that if, if surrender to change is where my worship begins, then it means that if I come to worship and I stand in nice, neat rows and I sing songs of worship and yet within my heart there is a resistance to change, then really my worship is empty because I missed first base. Do you understand? So that I have to... Surrender my heart to be transformed before I lift my voice to sing to Him or before I serve or before I worship in whatever way that it all begins with my willingness to be changed. Now there's one last thing and I'm going to close this in prayer and we're going to be done but there's one last thing I want to say to you and, and honestly this is really heavy. Uh, and so I'm going to just kind of throw it out there and, and we'll begin maybe here next week. But if worship begins with surrender to change, and if the primary aim of the gospel is to bring about change, then wouldn't it be true that if I, as a Christ follower, resist change in my life, I'm resisting the very purposes for which Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. And wouldn't then resistance to change be, in fact, rebellion against the cross? That's heavy, I know. So maybe we can begin there next week. Amen? If you're brave enough.